There is a known phenomenon which states that the more human an inhuman object looks, the more disturbed a person becomes. This is known as the uncanny valley. In a world of magic, alchemy, technology, and gods, the line between what is and what isn't human is horribly blurred. You can't rely on your own vision anymore to discern the difference. So, let me introduce an age-old question. If an inorganic object, say something created from either chalk or paper, was created with the express purpose of acting human, at what point does the programming end and the personality begins? Welcome to the art of the artificial lives in Genshin Impact, where I covered a fascinating topic of manufactured humanity. A character having the trait artificial actually has a lot of implications, and today I want to understand the thin line between programming and personality. Warning, this video is a compilation of several theories and speculations based on in-game lore. This is most especially true when I cover the actual characters. Majority of this video will be my own analysis on the topic and my own morbid fascination of the art of human creation. None of this is indicative of the final product. For this video, I want to dive deep into the existence of artificial life and Genshin Impact, the moral implications of having artificial humans in your world, and who are the existing and potential artificial lives we have both met and will meet in the future of the game. For the last part of the video, I will be theorizing about two other artificial entities, so stay tuned for that. But let's begin. Artificial life in Teyvat has existed for almost millennia, with several hints dating back as far as the Cataclysm era. Artificial life will be defined as simply an entity that was created with an express purpose of resembling human emotion or features, but is not currently organic. We see that there are several classifications of artificial life in Teyvat's history. First are the genuine robots created with no personality or autonomy. Additionally, it is also possible to put a human's essence into a robot. That is disgusting. Second are creations that are not inherently autonomous, but resemble human personality. These creations can mimic human speech and emotion, but their own capability to feel authentically is unknown. Thirdly are creations that mirror or simulate human-like behavior, personality, appearance, and intent. These creations are the highest form of artificial life, and it's almost impossible to discern them from real human beings. And fourth are creation by gods. So with that, let's investigate and theorize who or what the potential artificial life forms we can discern. Catherine is an entity that oversees the commission's distribution of the Adventurers League. When traversing through Thayvat, it is almost a necessity that you speak to her on a day-to-day -day basis. Her origins are unknown, but she speaks of an Adventurers League headquarters in Snezhnaya. What's more strange about her is the way that she speaks about the waypoints, and that she seems to be everywhere at once. Though, if you start listening closely, you'll hear her speaking to herself, a brief error message when she greets you good morning. Catherine as an entity is fascinating. She's obviously made to be a joke on the Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny trope, but the implications that she was created and duplicated has a lot of nuances. It could be possible that she was created for the express purpose of not only assistance, but also surveillance of the Adventurer's Guild. Consider this. The Catherines are constantly supervising the commissions around the whole Teyvat. If there was a person that seemed to be more powerful than your standard adventurer, it would be known by checking their logs on the commissions. Additionally, Catherine would know where an adventurer is by being able to ask them to go to a certain place or keep track where they are based on what commissions they took. But the question is, who would want to keep surveillance on the adventurers? It could just be the Adventurers Guild itself, but since the Adventurers Guild headquarters is in Sejnaya, it could also be under the supervision and manufacturing of the Fatui. Though your guess on who Catherine truly is and what she is capable of is as good as mine. It isn't impossible that the Fatui are capable of mass producing artificial intelligence and networks based on taking a dying human's body and shoving either their consciousness or the raw body itself into a metal shell. Because that's exactly what the Torah did in the manga. 
Dr. Krupp was a scientist working under the Torre who had requested for more test subjects for the heresy's underground arena. However, as he and the Torre were in Mondstadt, Dr. Krupp slipped away after being tricked by Kaya into going to the cellar, where he is confronted by Diluc. Diluc threatens him to confess where the children are, but before Dr. Krupp could respond, he is effectively neutralized by Il de Torre. We later see him newly formed and newly recreated into a killing machine, one devoid of humanity and life. There is something unsettling about the implication of Tartaglia claiming he's a living weapon, and seeing another Harbinger actually create a real living weapon from a dead man's corpse and consciousness. So that begs the question, just how much of the Fatui's arsenal are mechanical, and how many of them come from a more… organic source? After all, they have at least 139 human batteries to work with, and I doubt they'll put such good batteries to waste. The art of the puppet is a concept lost to Inazuma's history. Though paper charms and talismans are still a popular use, the creation that birthed the Shikigami is by one of divination and enchantment, and Shiki Taisho and Shiki Kosho are creations meant to protect. These are entities created by Kamuna Harunosuke, and while these small beings carry some kind of consciousness and personality, they certainly don't have free will. The Shikigami in Japanese folklore are small conjured beings that are associated with curses and magical powers. Their powers are tied closely with their master, and the Shiki can possess other life forms. However, if a master loses control of the paper charm, it's possible that the Shiki can go rogue. In Genshin, these entities were created to protect the samurai and help those who have been affected by the miasma. They can manipulate charms similar to the sigil of permission because it was said that Hironosuke was inspired by Liyuan arts. Though it's possible that Shiki Taisho and Shiki Kosho weren't the only ones that were created this way. We now move on to the Raiden Shogun puppet and Kunikutsushi, the perfected and the prototype. The Raiden Shogun puppet was a creation of A who follows her simple command of preserving eternity. Despite seeming hollow and emotionless, the Shogun is informed and intelligent. She follows a strict set of rules and doesn't bend for anyone because her programming doesn't allow her to. However, it is interesting to note that she is more than willing to defy A in the event A herself proves to be an enemy of eternity, meaning her loyalty doesn't lie with her creator, but rather the programming given to her. The Balladeer, on the other hand, was the previous six harbinger of the Fatui, and the first prototype of A during her many endeavors. He was insufficient, however, and cast aside like worthless dross. He began roaming in Azuma where he settled on the name Kunikusushi, meaning the country destroyer. This was from the cultural Inazuman theaters. He then meets with the Fatui where he was found and asked to return to Snezhnaya. What's fascinating about the balladeer is that he represents a fine line between programming and personality, because while he is sentient, expressive, and rude, there is a potential that wasn't of his own volition. In the Husk of Opulent Dreams, there was a quote stating that he had already acquired the heart that he had always dreamed of, but it was but a mere prop for lies and deception. It is possible that this isn't talking about the Gnosis, but rather the delusion that was given to him. Delusions and the energy within them are known to fester on a person's desires and lie to them that this is what they truly wanted. Additionally, his power was manipulated by the Fatui, and if Ildotore was the one that was working on the Konikusushi project, it's possible that he manipulated some aspects of Konikusushi to be more emotionally unstable. Of course, the stern and hated balladeer that he was towards his subordinates is definitely a part of his true self, that much I can agree on, but if he was created as a prototype by A, then he most likely had a more somber personality before joining the Fatui. Speaking of A, the origins of the two are from a mysterious technique that A found, but the technique was never confirmed, but I believe that it might be a variation of the Shikigami. The Balladeer's origins were never fully explained except that he was created by the Raiden Shogun as a previous vessel for the Gnosis. 
It was never confirmed how he was created except that he was made by A altering her divine form, but it is possible that he and by extension the Raiden Shogun's puppet were created by using Shikigami. First is that in the Husk of Opulent Dreams, it states that he saw a phantom dancing to the music under the moonlight in his dreams. The phantom was just like the young man in the distant past, who was akin to a blank sheet of paper. Secondly, Tartaglia knew to look for Scaramouche in a dungeon filled with paper charms, meaning that Tartaglia guessed there was a connection even before meeting Shiki Taisho. Thirdly, is that unlike the creation of the Magu Kenki, the Balladeer and the Shogun both have emotional responses and are capable of thought. While the Shogun seems to be more robotic, it is clear that she is her own entity that is just programmed to follow the orders of A. As for Scaramouche, he developed his own personality over the course of years, which means that the technique A used is completely capable of creating sentient entities. This is similar to how Shikitaisho acts around the Traveler, moving about like an independent creature. And fourth was that the technique could have been passed from Harunosuke to the Kitsune Saigu to A. Whether this is directly is up for debate, but since A was friends with the Saigu, it is a possible way for her to find the paper charms technique by examining the history of her friend. But moving on to things that were discarded because they weren't good enough. The 2.3 event opens up a whole new can of worms with the introduction of the Primordial Human Project. The Primordial Human Project was a project created by Ryan Daughter to make the perfected human being. This was the entity that birthed multiple synthetic humans. This was the project that created Subject 1. Subject 1 is the albedo that we are aware of as being the main albedo. Subject 1 was a successful creation and became Ryan's daughter's homunculus. However, unbeknownst to Subject 1, she had multiple failed experiments that were discarded. These failures were thrown into the dragon's stomach. And after that, Subject 1 was now peacefully living to pursue the mission left by his master. But then, for reasons unknown, one of the discarded prototypes was resurrected by the dragon's mysterious power. This was Subject 2. Subject 2, angered and envious of the life that Subject 1 now had, wanted to live that very life as well. So Subject 2 hatched the plan to mimic Subject 1, kill them, and replace them permanently. This plan brought forth Subject 3, a modified Whopper flower created to distract Subject 1. The Whopper flower replica would blend into the group, actively trying to harm Subject 1 in the process. This was all to draw Subject 1's attention. But now, Subject 2 is roaming free in Taivat, perhaps under a new guise or even a new life, watching and waiting for the chance to enact his revenge. And now that he knows where he made a mistake, he will learn and adapt. The story of Albedo and Fake Albedo, who I will now call as Alfredo, are actually pretty fascinating contrasts, all things considered. Similar to the Balladeer and Shogun situation, one is a rebellious prototype discarded by their maker because they were insufficient, and another is an entity trying to continue where their master left off. But the dialogue in the last act of the event actually hints why Albedo and Alfredo are so different. Albedo tells him of the story of the Rose Garden, and how the gardener is able to pick out the best roses. This may be an allegory to Ryan Daughter's project. First is that Albedo never considered himself as a creator. He even states that the word creator sounds so condescending and arrogant. Is creation an arrogant act, Traveler? If not, why do we call the ones that created us and control us gods? If it is, then what qualifies us to call ourselves creators? How far must we take our reverence and respect, and what purpose does it serve? Albedo is afraid of the implications of the word, but when you speak to the second Albedo in the end, the opinion is vastly contrasting. Well, I don't think being a gardener is so bad. Okay, but they're just sincerias. I think you're only so attached to them because you don't have much fruit of this quality in your possession. When someone's pockets are full and their spirit is fulfilled, they don't easily fall prey to this kind of yearning. This albedo isn't afraid to become a creator. 
In this case, he wants to usurp Rheingadr's title by also becoming a gardener himself. The plan may be that he mass produces the smaller entities, like the Whopper flowers, so that they too would be a good quality. That way, the meaning of their life is discarded because there's just so many of them, and if one of them dies, people could always just make more. But so what? So what if we have artificial life and Genshin Impact? Well, there's actually a lot of moral implications when a character is made through unnatural means. Let's begin with the first one. How are you sure that's the real one? If the 2.3 event is anything to go off on, it's that human life in this world is so easily replicated that how are you even sure the person you're talking to is their own individual person? It's completely possible that either you find a factory of Catherine somewhere in Snezhnaya, or even that the person you think you know was replaced by a robot in all its entirety. Which brings me to the second question. Is their life worth anything if there's so many of them? Mass production of artificial life is fascinating. The fake albedo makes mention of this, and it is a valid point. If you can easily be replaced, then does it really matter if you die? For example, a lot of people want Scaramouche to be playable by introducing the argument he can be factory resetted and we just remove that nasty parts of him from the Fatui. To that I raise the question, is that even Scaramouche at that point? No, right? Or yes, because it was created in the same way that Scaramouche was and the body still looks like him, so it is Scaramouche? Or, additionally, if we create another Scaramouche or another Albedo and just mimic the personality of the old ones, is it fair to say that they are the same person? And if so, why not? Well, a person can argue that their personality defines them. But there's another problem with that statement. How do you know that they even have a personality in the first place? Being artificial means that you have a set programming in your psyche, a series of codes that you are nurtured to follow. Even humans follow this. But the problem with being artificial is that this is an integral part of who you are. An example is the Raiden Shogun, the puppet acts on the simple code of preserving eternity. Or Catherine, who was created for the adventurer's guild despite seeming like a living and conversable person. Or what about the Balladeer? The Fatui could have reprogrammed him through his delusion and tampering, which was hinted to be the case in his opulent dream set. At what point does the programming end and the personality start? That is the fundamental part of humanity that artificial life forms don't necessarily have. Well, it just means that the secrets of Devat regarding human life are still unfolding, and I believe that with the two active plots of Scaramouche and Fake Albedo, we'll be seeing these moral conundrums pop up in the future. For example, Fontaine is an area of massive technological advancements, slightly lower to Snezhnaya. But with the coming of the two characters from Fontaine, it's possible that one of them is not necessarily organic. When you listen to the background noise, you hear the small ticking of a clock hand. Of the divine. Lynette Lanay may be inspired by John Eugene Robert Houdin, a French magician and watchmaker who was recognized as the father of modern style conjuring. Houdin was known to be a tinker of mechanical figures and automatic toys, so the gears and clockwork motif of Lynette and Lanay would play well into the theory one of them isn't real. He was also a master illusionist and relied on tricks to fool the human eye. But there's that. So, what do you guys think? Why do you guys think that robots are everywhere in Genshin Impact? And what are your thoughts on just how replaceable human life truly is? I think it's fascinating that Genshin's going through this trope since robots and media have such cool moral conundrums that I'm glad 2.3 covered. But with that, my name is Aster and thank, thank you for chilling with me.